right? It's the best feeling in the world when families get together and have a good time, right? Yeah, but isn't it the worst feeling in the world when families get together and start fighting? That's like the pits, that's like the worst, right? Well, I have my parents in town, and so this is all good, and we're having a great time getting together, doing our family thing as we always do. But today I want to talk, I'm continuing in our First Corinthians series called Saints and Sinners, and I want to talk a little bit about families, because families that get together, it can go one of two ways. It can either be really good, and it's awesome, we're having a good time, laughing and sharing jokes and all that good stuff, or there can be a little bit of sibling rivalry. Anybody had a lot of that growing up? Maybe you were the older, more dominant kid, and you just kind of took advantage of your younger sibling. Or maybe you were the younger kid, and you took advantage of the older ones. Yeah, you have some younger ones that are a little bit more aggressive than the older ones, right? Yeah. But families tend to have that. This is the experience we have in life. And in our families, we see it. But you know what? In church, we see it as well. We come together as God's family, and sometimes we fight. That's just one of the things that happen. But it's how we deal with those issues. It's how we deal with those problems so that I want to talk about today. Because Paul addresses that in the message here that we're going to cover today. Paul addresses sibling rivalry. We're going to title today's message, Family Feud. Family Feud. Why? Because there is no absence of family feud. There's always going to be some time where there is going to be some family feud going on. And we, as a church, need to know how to handle that. And also in our own families, we need to know how to handle that. But today we're going to focus on the church and what tends to happen when we see or experience family feud within God's house. Amen? How many of you believe it's a good thing to know how to treat God's house? We have to know how to get along with one another, right? It's not always going to be petunias and roses every day. Sometimes you're going to walk in, and I know we're called red thorn, but I mean, we don't need to be scratched, right? But sometimes it's going to feel a little abrasive sometimes, and we need to know how to handle those things. Paul's going to talk about that in his letter to the Corinthian church, and we're going to cover that in just a moment. So let's open in prayer, and we're going to dive in. Amen. Well, before we do, let's just welcome our Periscope audience. Just let them know it's good to have them. Come on, give them a red thorn and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word today. Thank you, Lord God, that you chose someone like me, Lord, who knows nothing about what he's doing, and you've given me a voice, and you've given me a message. And I pray that today, God, you just anoint this and let it be to your satisfaction, to your glory, and to the benefit of the people watching and listening. We thank you and praise you right now for the outcome in Jesus. Mighty name we pray, and everybody shout it. Amen. 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 So this is the first Corinthian. Uh, First Corinthians, we're in chapter number 6 today. We're going to cover the first uh, 11 verses of First Corinthians, chapter number 6. And we're going to talk a little bit about a few things that Paul has to address. Now, we've in the last few weeks, we've covered the fact that this church has some issues, right? They have some problems. Brand new church, they have issues. Well, we're not surprised by that because every church has issues, right? If you found a, 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 an imperfect church then you found most likely the right one. Because if the church was, was perfect, then I would like to leave this one and join the one that you're at because I don't think that there is a perfect church. Amen? And so we've seen that this church has some fighting going on and within themselves they have some issues that they have to work out. Paul is addressing a number of things that was brought to his attention by someone who remains nameless. Uh, this person was anonymous, but they went to Paul and they said, hey, there are some things going on with your church over in Corinth, and I think you need to pay some attention to this. And Paul, as you know, wasn't in the most comfortable of situations, right? Paul was always finding himself either shipwrecked, abandoned, homeless, beaten half to death. And as a matter of fact, most of his writings in church came from not a nice, cool office with piping AC, but was in some stink, dingy cell somewhere where the lighting was poor, there was no electricity, and was probably some very horrible conditions. But yet he somehow found the resolve within himself to hear from the Holy Spirit and to write these letters to the churches that he loved very dearly. And so we get to benefit a little bit from that today. We're going we're gonna to read here in just a moment of what's happening here. But in fighting that happens in church, there are two types of issues that we see and we experience. The first type of issues that we see and experience in churches are those that should be handled internally. Those that should be handled internally. And then we also see, conversely, those that should be handled externally. 
And we're going to cover the difference in the two. We need to know as a church which ones should be handled inside the church and which ones should be taken care of outside of the church. Amen? So this, consider this a little informative today. So we're going to cover that. But what is happening here is this church in Corinth, they're doing some really bad things to each other. And it's come to Paul's attention because they're doing things that should not be done in any scenario if they are a Christian. And as a matter of fact, Paul is saying here, you need to understand not only the error of what you're doing, but the way you're doing it. And some adjustments need to be made. And he's about to tell them what those things are. And what they're doing, and I'll just give you a little heads up, is they're dragging their brothers and sisters before the magistrate, before the court, suing brothers and sisters over things. Now, how many of you know that's always an ugly thing in church? In the church circle, in the Christian world. Brothers suing brothers, and sisters suing sisters, and vice versa, and all that good stuff, right? All that bad stuff. And so today we're going to cover that, and uh, we're going to read here first uh, 11 verses. Let's get started. It says, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that, that we are to judge angels? How much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this, is, I say this to your shame. Can it be? That there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers. But brother goes against law, goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not do not be deceived? Neither the sexual, immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So, he's covering a couple of things here, very, very specific things. And the first thing here, in verse number one, he's talking about some grievances that they're having with one another. Now, we all have these little issues with one another from time to time, but very rarely do they escalate to the point where it becomes something legal. This was a very specific thing that was going on within this church. We do see it from time to time in our world today as well. And Paul is saying here, you're handling it and you're going about this the wrong way. And he's posing some questions to, to them. In, in, in other words, to paraphrase, he's like, don't you understand who you are in Christ Jesus? Why are you behaving this way? This is not according to the standard that God has given you. This is absolutely not according to the law of Moses, which is the word that you go by. So where did you find this behavior from? Why are you acting out in such a manner? And he's expressing these disputes that are related to property and money. Predominantly, specifically, property and money. And in verse 7, he's asking the question, why not be defrauded? So this is specifically talking about money. And he's making the point that these sensitive matters should be handled at the church level. He's saying to them, they're going to these ungodly, unrighteous magistrates instead of being handled internally within the church. So you don't take matters that are meant to be dealt with by the house, under the house rules, and take it beyond the walls of the house. Because you need to be qualified, have qualified people address these matters and take care of those things. Amen? Amen. And so he also believes here that the judicial system is where criminal cases should be tried in court. So you have the matters that are non-criminal related that should be handled by the church, but once it gets to criminal level, that's when it should be handled outside of the church. Amen? We have a legal obligation to deal with criminal activity in such a manner that the law would expect of us, whether we be Christians or not. That's where we draw the line. Amen? If somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, I murdered somebody. 
Well, I have a Christian and spiritual obligation and duty to counsel with them, but I also have a legal and a judicial obligation to deal with that matter as far as what the law expects of me. We have to now take this to the authorities and speak to them about what happened. Amen? We can't just cover that and keep it to ourselves. So this is a distinction Paul is talking about. And there are those who are trying to say that Paul doesn't really believe that you should take anything at all to the outside of the church. And they're arguing over that, but Paul is saying not so. I do believe that there are two distinctly different types of issues. And this is one of those issues that uh, should be dealt with in the church. And here is how we believe that Paul also believes that there should be judicial issues that are dealt with by the judicial authorities. Romans 13, 1 through 5. Here is what he says in his letter to the Romans. He says, Let every person be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. How many of you know God is above all authority? Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For those of you who say, Well, I don't like cops. Newsflash, cops fall under God's authority. God's appointed authority. Now, are there good cops and bad cops? Absolutely. But the authority of the office is appointed by God. It says, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. If you're afraid of the, ju the judicial system, then behave yourself, is what he's saying. If you don't want to get in trouble, then do it. don't do anything that will cause you to end up in prison. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. As a matter of fact, what he's saying here is, they have delegated authority and power for a reason, and they will not hesitate to use it if necessary. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. He is understanding that civil government has a responsibility under God to take care of civil judicial matters. And those are the things that should be dealt with outside of the church. And so he has no problem with that. But Paul says, the issues that you're carrying to court, it's not worth it. These are matters you should be handling at home. And how many times do we fight with our brothers and sisters and we take things way too far? We take things way out of context. What is a small issue that should be taken care of at a low level, next thing you know, we're trying to deal with it at a much higher level, and it's for what? For what reason? We sometimes jump the gun, right? We sometimes act too quickly, or we act out of anger or frustration, and we do the wrong thing, and we're like, how dare you do this to me? And the first thing we think is, retaliation! And so we try to pick the thing that is the, 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 the highest form of retaliation. How can I really make them pay? How can I get them to really suffer for what they did to me? And we think before, or we don't think before we act, and then we end up doing something completely outside of the scope of God's will. This is the, the case that's going on here with this church. And he says, criminal matters are the only things that should be taken care of in those types of cases. It's the jurisdiction of the state and should not be handled at the church level. Now here is why God sets that up, uh, the, the criminal justice system, it's for the protection of all of God's people, right? And for all of the people that, that even don't belong to God. It's just fair across the board. Amen. How many of you know without a judicial system, then rioting and anarchy would be at an even higher uh, level. It would be completely out of control. You think the world's gone wild and crazy now, what do you think would happen if there was absolutely no authority that helped govern things like that? Of course, we know prisons are overrun right now, and, and it's record numbers of, of especially young men, but even young women as well, that are in prisons today. But could you imagine a lawless society, what that would look like? So there has to be some, someone there to guard the gates. To guard the gates. Now, not all cases are like this, right? Both parties, in this case, who have a dispute against one another, are from the same church. Both parties are from the same church, which makes this a really big deal for Paul. He's saying the person you have ought against is bad enough that you're a Christian and you're dragging somebody to court, or a brother or sister to court, but you two belong to the same congregation. 
So it's really bad that you're doing this. And you have to be careful how you present yourselves. And he says here, in verse number 5, this is how we know, because it reads, I say this to your shame, can it be that there is no one among you who is wise enough? So, no one among you. So this is the congregation where the problem is, right? Brother against brother, having issues with one another here. And we know it's about property or money because in verse 7, he's talking about being defrauded. Why are, why not be defrauded? He's saying, why not just handle it without taking it to court, is what he's saying. If someone's going to defraud you, yeah, it might be bad, but that would be better than dragging them off to court. So this has to do with property, money, something to that effect, right? And Paul is saying, that's not the type of issues we need to carry to court. And I will tell you, in churches... You do see that. Christians fight against Christians in legal battles over things like money. As a matter of fact, most like most of the time, it has to do with money or property. Most of the time, it has to do with money or property. You know, people say money changes people. But I believe money just really magnifies who you really are. And you want to see how someone really is? Let there be an inheritance left that kids have to fight over. Then you really see the real side of people, right? Because money brings that side out of them. So he's saying Christians shouldn't be worried about things like that. We should be wise and godly in our dealings with one another. You know why? Because the world is watching what Jesus' church is doing. The world is watching, and the world is very critical of what Jesus' church is doing. Because the world is the antithesis of Jesus' church. The world is the enemy of Jesus' church. Those who are outside of God's will do not enjoy the things about God's will. Amen? And so the world is constantly watching, critiquing, and getting ready to put on blast whatever it is that's going on within the church. So we have to guard ourselves and be protected and make sure that we are above reproach in society, in the community, and within the world that we live in today. The church already takes a bad rap for a lot of things and we need not exacerbate the problem by doing even worse things. Amen? Amen. And so he's saying you need to watch your conduct and your behavior. Not only is Jesus' church at risk, but your individual testimonies now become at risk. Your individual testimonies. How then can you go and testify and witness to your friends, neighbors, and co-workers if you're dragging out this legal battle that you're talking about on Facebook and talking to your friends about? That's not a good look. And it's absolutely not a good witness for Christ. And we can't be hypocritical in our behavior. Amen? Amen. We have to live it, not just say it. we got to walk this thing out. Amen? See, when the Bible says things like flee temptation, we always think of the bad, bad, bad things. But you can flee a temptation of doing something like this as well. So we have to be careful. These leaders that are set up in God's church are people that God has ordained for the purpose of governing and ruling within His church. Amen? Amen. And Paul is describing to them, he's saying, when it comes to matters that belong inside of the church, they are qualified, godly, wise leaders that are supposed to be speaking into the lives of the people. If you have a problem, go to your leader about it. Let them speak into your life. Let them counsel with you behind closed doors. You and the second party have everybody together in one room and let's hatch this thing out. Let's deal with this on the local church level. Because God has given His leaders wisdom to be able to handle things like that. Mm -hmm. But Paul is asking the question, is there none among you that's qualified? Is that the reason why you're going beyond the, the walls of the church to the courthouse? That can't be the reason. Because it's, it's a question that's rhetorical because he's pretty sure he knows what the answer to that question is. Right? Why are you seeking these leaders? And the leaders that do set up Leadership over matters like this should, of course, A, be wise, but B, should be unbiased. 
They should have no stake in what's going on. They shouldn't lean to the left nor the right based on something personal. Unbiased, down the middle, no favoritism, nothing like that going on, to give an objective set of counseling to those parties of people. That's the way it should be in church. Now here is the Bible's order of things. This is how we deal with private matters. And Paul explains all of this. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, Paul explains his part of it. But we also see Jesus does in the book of in, in Matthew. Here's what it says in Matthew 18, 15. And it talks about when brothers and sisters have sibling rivalry. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Here is what we tend not to do. Oh, I'm not confrontational. So... I really didn't want to say anything to them. So what we do, we do the worst thing and we go tell other people instead. But what's the first move? Go, go tell him, go tell her, face to face, be man or woman enough to sit down face to face and say, look, can we talk about this? Can we talk about this, right? Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he does not listen, I don't even know, he's not always going to listen. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you. That every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, you know what's the most important word in that whole verse right there? The word evidence. Because here is what we tend to do. Even if we do follow that guideline and we take two people with us, most likely it's going to be two people that's going to side with us. We're not going to necessarily take two unbiased people. We're going to take two of our friends. So that if things get out of hand, our friends got our back. But the key word here is evidence. You have to weigh the evidence. That's what's going to make it a fair assessment. Amen? Amen. It's about being fair here. So it says here, Take one or two along with you. Every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. You see the progression here? And if he refuses to listen to the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Again, I say to you, two or three shall agree on anything on earth that you ask. It shall be done for them by my Father in heaven. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm among them. We quote that end part a lot, but we tend to forget what context it was born out of. Yes? God is saying here, when two or three of you get together, you weigh the evidence, you figure out exactly what's going on, you make your assessment, and you make your plan, and then you execute that plan, whatever you decide, I'm going to back you in heaven. That's what that scripture really means. You bind that in earth, it's bound in heaven. If it's loose on earth, it's loose in heaven. If they're found guilty on earth, they're guilty in heaven. If they're innocent on earth, they're innocent in heaven. Get that? So this is how we handle those matters. It's progressive. And you know what I love about it? It's a picture of grace. It's a picture of grace. Because God doesn't just strike us dead when we commit our first sin. See, no matter how bad it was, what they did to you, there should still be a measure of grace allowed to them. Because guess what? We would still want a measure of grace extended to us. Let's take a moment and think of all the horrible things we did. And that was just in the last two days. And we would want God to give us grace, right? So God says, let's take this thing step by step by step before we get to that final judgment. That's what God does with us. It's a picture of the grace of Jesus Christ. We sin over and repeatedly. God takes us from one process to the next. For some of us, He gives us signs and we ignore them. And then He gives us an action and we ignore it. Or we get sick and we ignore it. Or we ignore it. Or we lose all our money and we ignore it. There are different ways that God takes us through this process. And each time we find ourselves in that situation, we say, Oh Lord, I repent, I'm so sorry, I'll never do it again. And we don't really mean it. And then we do it again. And then there's something else. And on and on it goes, right? But aren't you glad God gives us a process? Yes. It's a picture of His grace. Before things get escalated. So Paul 
that mentions the unrighteous. Verse 1, he says, When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous? And he's most likely referring to the magistrates that are not only unbelievers, but they are unfair in their dealings. And he mentions it again in verse number 6. If we jump down in verse number 6, he says here, But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. So he is saying here, this is the world system. They don't think the way we do. Their set of rules and standards are a little bit different from ours. Now where they are set up and appointed by God, it's always good to have wise counsel at the same time, godly counsel. But he is saying here, this is a spiritual matter that you're taking to someone who does not have spiritual authority over this matter. They have judicial authority, but they have no spiritual authority. So we handle spiritual matters by spiritual appointees. And you handle judicial matters by? You are so smart. Amen. So he was making the distinction here. And these internal issues can tend to get out of hand. And how many of you know that it's very scandalous when the church has issues? Very scandalous. And we try to avoid that. And no matter how much we try, stuff gets leaked out. Somebody says something to someone, somebody finds out about something, stuff gets out. The church already has a hard time maintaining itself and maintaining its posture in society, but we really do have to guard ourselves and we do that predominantly by prayer. This is why regular and assertive prayer is absolutely necess uh, necessary. We have to cover ourselves, we have to cover our brothers and sisters, we have to cover our leaders, because we're all susceptible to attacks from the enemy. We're all susceptible to our own proclivities as well. So we need all the prayer we can get from each other. Amen? Don't think pastor is so anointed that he doesn't need prayer. I know Sister Laura is like the holiest person you've ever met. But she may need your prayer. Amen? Amen. So we have to pray. Pray, pray, pray. Take nothing for granted. Okay, then he mentioned something. Saints will judge the world and angels. Okay, this is interesting. Verse number 2 is where he talks about that. Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And, and if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that there are, that we are to judge angels? Okay, so here is the deal. Judgment day comes along. We always think about it. Okay, Jesus is going to be on the throne. Jesus is going to judge all the sinners. He's going to judge the world. He's going to pronounce judgment on whoever needs judgment pronounced upon them, right? But what we think is we're probably going to be somewhere on the sidelines just watching the whole thing happen. Well, guess what we're going to be doing if we're saints? We're going to be seated with him, helping him in the judgment process. That's what we're going to be doing. So now that gives a little bit of a different angle on, you can't judge me. Well, maybe I can. Maybe I will. We'll just have to see. Yeah, we will. Let's look at Matthew 19, 28. Because some of you are looking at me weird. It says, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones. Doing what? Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what we'll be doing. Those who are followers of Christ. Followers of Christ. And that word follower doesn't just mean we're just sort of heading in his direction. It means we're actively living a life for Jesus. Totally submitted and surrendered to him. We will then be promoted to a place of a judicial authority along with Jesus Christ. He says, I bring you up with me to help me do this. Christ didn't have to do that. It's all in his providential grace that he's allowing us to participate and partake in, in such an important event. Amen. Amen. Then he mentions it again in Revelation 3.21. It says, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me. Where? Shout it like you mean it. On my, on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So Jesus is saying, Dad promoted me, I'm going to promote you too. And together, we will rule and reign together. 
So that's when you hear uh, verses of scripture quoted like seated in heavenly places with Christ. That's what he means by that. He says, I'm bringing you up to my level now. So that you can rule and reign with me Amen. from a higher position. Amen. So, Joe, so those who belong to Jesus will help him rule. And then he talks about something called shame. Verse number five. I say this to your shame because the Corinthians already have a really big problem with arrogance. We've talked about this from the beginning, from chapter one. They have a very big problem with arrogance. They are wiser in their minds than they actually are. And they think they're all that. And because of this, they're acting very shamefully. And what Paul is trying to say here is, you are not acting as you should. And it's very, very shameful. You think you're smart, you think you're wise, but all you're doing is embarrassing yourselves and the church of Jesus Christ. And it's shameful what you're doing. Their attitude and behavior was, uh, was horrible. You might remember this when we covered chapter 14, verse, ch I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 18. This is what he said. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills. I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. What is he saying here? I want to see if you can back up all that mouth you got. I'll be there shortly to see what you got. He says, because you're arrogant. You're arrogant. You're not behaving the way you ought to, and you have the audacity to have a mouthpiece behind it. He says, you can't back that up. So it's a shameful thing when Christians behave like this in the world. It's always terrible. I know for me, I hate to hear when Christians are suing one another. If it's some extreme case, then that might be once every blue moon, right? But that should absolutely and certainly be avoided as much as possible. Because it's never a good thing to hear the church being talked about that way. Never a good thing. And it brings shame to us who are Christians and it brings shame to Jesus Christ as well. And then he says, you are suffering wrong. Verses 7 and 8. He says, to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brother. So he said, it's better for you to just say, you know what, I can see. You got one up on me, that's it. Let's not take this to a whole nother level. But how many times do we reconcile that way? How often is it that we go to great lengths, even though we may have suffered, and when he said suffer loss, in some cases it might be a lot of money involved. There might be a lot of reputation at stake. There might be a lot of resources that are just disappearing from under you. It might be hurtful. It might be really, really crippling for you. But he says, it's better to concede, suffer defeat, suffer your loss, than to take that to the next level. Wasn't Jesus a really prime example of how to suffer loss and be okay with it? But what do we do? We subscribe to one-upping them, right? If you did this to me, I'm going to do that to you. And what I'm going to give you is going to be worse than what you gave me. And this is how we tend to operate in the world, and this is how we tend to operate in the church. And Paul says there's no place for that in Jesus' church. And the, the wrong that they are suffering has to do, of course, with using unrighteous magistrates to judge their civil cases. He said there's something definitely wrong with that. Believers acting like unbelievers can cause suffering. This can cause a suffering for the church. When we behave like that, we suffer. The world doesn't suffer. The world doesn't care. We suffer. When we treat our own like that, when we behave like that, we suffer. We always feel the, the repercussions of that type of activity, that type of behavior. Saints are sanctified holy people whom God's call to a higher standard. Paul says, this is not becoming of a good Christian. God's called you higher than that. Let's recall what Paul said in, in chapter 317. This is what he says. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are in, uh, you, uh, sorry, and you are that temple. 
So he's saying here, you have to behave like you are actually the house of God. He resides in you. He lives in you. He's operating through you. So your manner of conduct has to match what's going on on the inside of you. We can't have one set of activity happening in our hearts, but be displaying something completely different to the world. I think there is something desperately wrong if you see that type of behavior. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth is going to speak, right? So if your words are, are a reflection of what's going on in your heart, then what do you think your actions are? Absolutely a reflection of what's going on on the inside. And we who are Christians are Jesus' temple. We should act accordingly. And then he goes on to talk about unrighteousness, verses 9 and 10. He says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Then he goes on to mention a few things here. Now, Paul is implying that your behavior is indistinguishable from that of an unbeliever. Right? You might be in the church... But if you're behaving like an unbeliever, you're not of the church. People go to church all day long, but not everyone who attends church is a Christian. Sad truth is, many people on the day of judgment will think they went to go into heaven because they did these things that they thought were the right things to do, but their hearts were tainted. And God says you, there was never any conversion of the heart. You knew the language to speak, you knew the right things to say, you knew the right things to show other people, but was there actual conversion in your heart? Are you loving people? Are you forgiving people? Are you speaking well of people? Are you carrying on the mission and vision of God's put in your heart, or are you still pushing your agenda? Which one are you doing? So he's saying, don't just be in the church. Be of the church. Be a part of the body. Be a part of the family. There are a lot of people that visit a lot of homes. But only family get to live there. Only family truly get to live there. So we need to figure out if we are family or not. Then he talks about men who practice homosexuality. Now I know this is a very, very sore subject today. This is taboo today. People get threats from stuff like this. People feel offended from stuff like this. This is something we have to address because God's given us a mission and we have to preach this Bible. We don't get to tear out pages that we don't like. We have to preach the Bible in its entirety. All right. So here's what he says. Men who practice homosexuality. Now that phrase comes from a Greek word, mal malakos, which refers specifically to male homosexuals. But Paul, even though in this particular context is specifically talking to the men, pretty much, I'm sure, because of the reports that he was getting, Paul also, though, addresses women. He also addresses women, not here, but in Romans. And here's what he says in Romans 1, 21. He says, For although they knew God, they did not honor Him, or honor or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So he's saying, yeah, these are people who are supposed to know better. They claim to know God. They know enough about Him to know what He expects. But in their twisted thinking, they've gone on a totally different course. Doesn't that sound like the people who Paul is addressing here? These are Christians in the Corinthian church. He's saying, you know how to act. You know how to live. But in your arrogance, you're choosing to do other things. Then it goes on to say, Therefore God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. What does he say here? God created us to do what God created us to do, but instead of worshiping the Creator and doing things His way, we rather would like to take creation and do whatever we want with creation. That's a form of worshiping the creation, not the Creator. And just twisting things around. It says God gave them up to the lust in their hearts. Verse 26, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women, this is where He mentions the women, exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. 
Then he mentions the men again, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Now, I'm not going to go on too long to push this point because you get the picture, you get the message. So I'm just using Romans as an example to show you that Paul is, op is opposing homosexuality both in males and in females. However, Paul does not only mention homosexuality, he also mentions a few other sins it's in there as well. Idolaters. Those who worship anything in place of God is an idolater. The spot that is reserved for God is reserved for God. And anything or anyone that we put in that spot becomes an idol to us. Why do we get mad when people talk to us about certain things? Because they're messing with our idol. And we don't want people to mess with our idols. When people ask you, why do you give your money to that church? They have a problem with that because money is their idol. So we have to make sure we understand that God should not only be at the head of all things, but Jesus should be at the center of all things. And if Jesus is at the center of all things, then everything else comes under that. So we, he's mentioning idolaters. Of course, adulterers. You know what adulterer is? Anything that is sexually related outside of the confines of marriage is adultery. You should not date or have any sort of inappropriate relationship with someone who's married or you with someone else if you are married. Adultery. And of course Jesus takes it, takes it to a higher level, right? We look at the laws of Moses and he says, okay, well, New Testament's different. We're under, under grace now. We're not under, under the law. Well, that's true, but what we don't realize is that the new covenant is at a higher level than the old one, not a lower one. And people tend to try to make it as if it's a lower covenant, not a higher one. They think that we have a scapegoat now and we can do whatever we want. And I'll give you an example. In the Old Testament, if you were to have sexual relationship with someone who is married or if you're married outside of the confines of marriage, that was adultery. But guess what Jesus said? He says, well, see, you guys are using that as an excuse to lust. So let me just redo this just a little bit. If you even look at her the wrong way, you can consider that adultery. So it's at a higher standard, not a lower one. And then he says, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice these things, those who make a lifestyle of these things, those who live this way can expect to inherit the kingdom of God. Riotous living is not something that qualifies you for a heaven living or for heaven residency. Not going to happen. Okay, then finally, verse number 11. He's talking about being washed, sanctified, and justified. He says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. And I like how he starts off, and such were some of you. He is reminding them that that's the old life you used to live. Such were some of you. He could have said some, such are some of you because you're still behaving that way. But what was he doing? He was reminding them that that's the old person that has died with Christ, has resurrected again, and should be living a much different life. Reminder for us, such were some of us, right? We did all manner of bad things. We did. But by the sanctifying grace of God, we get to have our sins washed away. Amen. So here's washed. That's the first step. You ever had a little kid outside playing and you just let them play, play outside for a little while? Have fun, the sun's not too hot, can't do it in this Vegas heat right now. That would be really bad. People die in heat strokes around here. But if the weather's okay, you let a child play outside. I know growing up, we used to play outside a lot. There was no you know, internet and all that stuff going on, so we didn't have the indoor attraction that we did back then. And so we played outside, that's what we knew. And then after a nice full day of playing and having fun, you come inside and it was the first thing you need to do. Take a shower, take a bath. Get that dirt off first. 
before you do anything else, can't sit to the table, can't do anything, you go to the shower first and then everything else, right? Well, we're like that when we sin. We're out in the world and we're getting grimy, we're getting dirty and we think we're having fun. And then dad says, okay, time to come indoors. First thing Jesus does, I'm going to wash you. I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to get the world stink off of you. Because now we have to clean you up so that you're fit to be in the house. Amen? So the first thing is they are washed. And this dirt is like a cleansing that happens. But the thing is in church, it's a spiritual cleansing, not a physical one. So our hearts have to be cleansed. The Bible talks about the heart devising all manner of evil. It says the heart is wicked and deceitful and no one knows it, really. It's the central hub of all planning of all evil things. That's what happens in our hearts. So that's the thing that needs to be cleaned and cleansed. And what we tend to try to do is we tend to try to fix an action instead of trying to fix a motive. And a lot of people, we never go through the conversion process, but we expect to have a different outcome in our actions. And God says, you're never going to change what you do unless you change who you are. And you have to allow your heart to go through a transformative uh, progression before you accept, expect that your life is going to change. That's why people come to church and try to act like Christians, but they, their lives will depict something else. Because they're avoiding the true transformation. But I know that's not of us, right? That's nobody here. So this is a spiritual cleansing. Titus 3.5 says, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by what? The washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That's how God saves us, is through washing us through His Holy Spirit. That's why when we do uh, observe the sacraments of communion and baptism. Baptism is not just washing of water. It's the Holy Spirit washing us and regenerating our hearts. That's what's represented when we go in that water and come up again. We are regenerated. We are clean not only on the outside, we're clean on the inside as well. Perfect? No. Clean and sanctified according to God's standard? Yes. So that's being washed. And then we're sanctified which is kind of similar to washing, but it expresses that we no longer have the same relationship with sin that we used to. I've been on a diet recently. I know some of you probably noticed a little difference. But the one thing I got to learn about diets is you can't effectively diet unless you change your relationship with food. Right? Because then it's going to really be hard from meal to meal trying to figure out what am I going to do when I'm tempted with that cake and all these different things? And for me, I like sweets and starches, and those are both things that I don't need to have in my life, right? So we have to change our relationship with food. And based on the relationship, that will help us to be successful or not be successful, right? So what does that mean? We have to understand, okay, what am I going to do with food? Am I going to just use food for enjoyment? Or am I going to use food for sustenance? And when I can, I'll enjoy a meal or two. That completely changes the landscape, right? Two totally different things. Well, when we look at sanctification, it's kind of like that. Because to be sanctified means to set aside for a holy purpose, and it's, the, it's a lifestyle change that ends up happening. So we treat sin the same way we treat a diet. We have to realize what our relationship looks like. And we have to say, you know what? I'm no longer in love with the things I used to be in love with anymore. I used to live for the clubs, I don't live for the clubs anymore. I used to live to do this and to do that. I don't do those things anymore. That's not my relationship with them. You understand the difference? So that way, if you do sin, it's not because you were actively pursuing it. It's because you were tempted. You may have sinned. You can ask forgiveness. You move on. It's completely different when you're heading in that direction than when you're heading away from that direction and you just happen to sin while you're moving toward God. Big difference between the two things. So how is your relationship with sin. What does that look like? What does that look like? Are you treating sin the way God would treat sin? Are you noticing things in your life that really do need to be extracted and removed because you know it's doing you no good? Just like some things in your diet. Amen. When the doctor told me no sugar, no starch, I'm like, are you kidding? Kill me now! <laughs> That's everything! And you have to get used to it, right? 
The same thing with living with Christ. At some point, and, and can I tell you while I'm using that same analogy, that even when I went back and started eating things I had stopped eating, it wasn't the same experience anymore. We were just talking about this. Suddenly your body rejects the same things that it used to long for. Right? Suddenly it's not as enjoyable anymore. You're like, I used to like soda, but now it really tastes artificial. Because I've been drinking a lot of water. That's how it should be with sin. We should immediately notice the difference. And when we do slip and fall into sin, it has a little bit of a distaste for us now. And we have a distaste for it. We're like, you know what? I used to have fun and I thought this would be fun. Backsliding, and eh, eh, no fun. Jesus, I miss you. Back on track. That's what a true relationship should look like for a Christian. The Bible says sin is sweet for a season. Why do you think it's only for a season? Because it's just like going, having a drink. Or drinking too much. Right after you've had fun, then there comes the hangover part that you got to deal with. And sin has hangovers. Because then you start to regret what you did. You start to feel really awful. And you start to feel really... And if you say, Pastor, not me. Well then, something's wrong. You can't sin and have no conscience if you're a Christian. There should be some conscience that follows that. So here's where we see that we really have no need for it anymore. We thought we needed it, but we really didn't. It's like yesterday we were out running some errands, and I'm like, I'm going to have a frappuccino, because I kind of used to really, really, really like those. And it kind of soothed my conscience, I told him, just half the sweetener. Well, the yeah, app was enjoyable for a minute, and then after that it was like, why did I do that? And I'm like, if I can do it all over again, I was telling my mom, I said, if I can do it all over again, I'll, I'll minus the... Frappuccino and the second hamburger. But anyway. <laughs> but this is what happens, right? We're remorseful. And God is saying to us, you really thought you needed that in your life, but you really didn't. And we don't really see the benefit of that until after we start to walk with the Lord over time. And after a while, we say, you know what? I really didn't need that in my life. Thought I did, but really didn't. Really didn't. Sanctification is an ongoing process for a Christian as well, just like your diet is, and I'm wrapping up. It's an ongoing process. So don't think you have to be perfect. You miss and eat something you shouldn't eat if you're on a diet. Don't get bent out of shape, right? Just keep moving. Keep moving. You drank a soda, what do they say? Drink 15 glasses of water to dilute it. Same thing with sin. If you sin, pick up and keep moving. Remember the line of continuum. If you were a negative eight and you become a negative six, that's progress. Don't get bent out of shape. Just keep moving in the right direction until you get into the positives. Hebrews 12.1 says, since, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings to us closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What, what is he saying here? Is you have to put some effort into it. You got to work it out. Run this race with endurance. Endurance means time. I did a little bit of sports in school, but the one thing I was not good at was anything long distance. But endurance has to do with distance, right? So he's saying here, you have to be fit for a long distance in this life. So being sanctified, be prepared for the long haul. Hebrews 12, 14 says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Strive. Strive. That's another word that denotes working. Working. Putting an effort in. Strive for it. Reach for it. Keep going after it. You're not going to get there tomorrow, but just keep moving. Yeah. Keep moving. So you're not just sanctified. You're being sanctified every day. Until Jesus comes or you die, whichever happens first. And then finally he says, you have to be justified. Justified. And of course we talk about justified means it's just as if I did the sin, right? So Paul is using this word because it has two meanings. There's an ethical meaning and there's a judicial meaning. Now Paul is not using it in his ethical meaning because he says, you are already justified through Jesus. You don't justify yourself. Jesus has already qualified you, so you're justified by his grace. So when he's using the word justified, he's talking about it in the judicial sense here. 
Because he says, God's already declared you to be righteous. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, right? So we're all justified through faith. Because our righteousness is not in what we can do, but it's in what Jesus has already done. What makes it so that Jesus can justify us? The fact that Jesus has lived a perfect life. That's where our righteousness comes from. It comes from His righteousness. He is only righteous because He was perfect. We're not perfect, but we gain His righteousness. And thank God that He's set it up that way. Or else we would all disqualify, be disqualified from going to heaven. But Paul's point here is that we have to behave in a manner that is consistent with the righteousness that Christ has already born for us. We have to behave in that manner. Judiciously, yes, absolutely. Behave in that manner. He says, you're justified by Christ. You don't need to go around suing one another. You don't need to be behaving in such a manner that is detestable to God and that brings a reproach upon His church. And we all suffer in various ways of doing things that are not really worthy of, of, of God's approval. And we have to beg His forgiveness. We have to be humble enough to say, Lord, I'm wrong. I wanted to have my own way. Yeah, I was angry. I was upset. I was disappointed. Whatever it is, He said, but you know what? I'm going to release this to you. It's hurting. It's a, it's a burden, but I'm going to roll this over on your shoulders because it's the way you want me to deal with it. Not always easy, I'm telling you, and you know, but absolutely necessary. Because we continue to carry that thing and it's going to eventually roll over us and take us out. And Jesus says, your shoulders aren't broad enough for that. You need to let me handle, handle that. Amen? Amen? This is how the church should operate. Matters that belong in the church, we deal with in the church. Matters that are for ju the justice department, when and if that ever happens, we take it there. Not beforehand. Not beforehand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your church. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your governance and your guidance. Thank you, Lord, that you have principles that we should abide by and live by, Lord. And it's for our benefit. It's for the health and strength of our church. We thank you, God, that you are the governing, uh, presiding God over our church, Lord God. And what you say goes, Lord. And we pray, Father, for every church represented out there as well, that they would do things your way, not the world's way. We pray for each individual in those churches, Lord, that if they have aught with their brothers and sisters, that they would carry it out in the right way, that they would approach one another in brotherly love, in sisterly love, with a view to reconciliation, Lord, not a view to, to, to cause harm or to retaliate against what has been done to them. But we pray, God, that it's all with a mission, Lord, to be united together as one body. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, because we know that your word declares that a house that is divided, by its, uh, divided within itself cannot stand. So we pray for strength and unity so that your church will be strong and will be progressive. We give you praise. We give you thanks. We give you honor. We give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. 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 Amen.